Good morning, Vision Family, and good morning, Vision Virtual. And let me say a happy Friends and Family Day. I hope you've invited tons of friends and family to join us as we worship Christ today. Also, don't forget, at the end of this, we are going to take Holy Communion and honor what Jesus has done for us. Do me a favor, get Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to read verses 14 down to 30. But a couple things before we dive in, read the word, pray. First, if you are a first-time guest, Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for watching. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for responding to an invitation or a tag or a share. However you got here, we are so thrilled that you are here and we hope that we make you feel welcome and we hope that we see you again next week. Family, a couple, couple things I want to remind you of. Uh, number one, we've partnered with Activate Good. They're giving out thousands of laptops and hotspots to provide needs. You know, this corona has, has really wrecked a lot of people's routine and tons of students, thousands of students are in need of Wi-Fi, they're in need of laptops, laptops are on back order, all types of issues, but we're excited to partner with them. And so we, we want you to serve. This is what we do as a church. We serve our community, we serve our city. So log on to visionrdu.com backslash events and you will see how you can serve and it'll answer any questions that you may have. Again, after this Friends and Family Day service, immediately after this, we're we gonna have a meet and greet uh, with me and some of the other elders. So you have questions about, about our church, we, we would love to meet you. We would love to answer any questions that you may have. And last but not least, as we pray today, I wanna say, a specific prayer for our teachers. Students as well, but specifically our teachers. We have tons of educators at our church. I want you to know that we love you, we appreciate you, and we are here for you, and we are going to pray for you. We're praying with you, we support you, we are holding you up in prayer. Well, if you are ready for the word, just type, I'm ready. Come on, put it in all caps, I'm ready. I'm excited, you're ready to hear the word. Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. We're going to read all the way down to verse 30. I'm going to pray for you. I want you to pray for me, and we're going to see what the Lord has for us today. Hear now the word of the Lord. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. The one he gave five talents to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went and put them to work and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two talents earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, his master, the master of those servants, came back and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Servant, you were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I was afraid and I went off and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to the one who has more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good for nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Wow, a lot to cover. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your kindness and your mercy. Thank you for sustaining us. Even in the midst of this pandemic, God, you are God, you are king, you are faithful, and we love you. God, I just pray for a spirit of revival in every church. 
I pray for a, a, a spirit of just radical generosity and faith. And I pray for a spirit of longevity. I know many of us are just fatigued. We're fatigued watching every week. We're, we're fatigued of this kind of computer routine and, and it's draining some of us and we just need you to revive us. So I just ask that you would do that even now, Jesus. God, but I wanna say a special prayer for every educator, every teacher, God, let them know that they are loved. Let them know they are supported. Many of them feel unsupported, underappreciated, underpaid, God. And I pray that you meet needs. I pray that they know that we love them, that we are here for them, and we are holding them up in prayer the same way Moses uh, and Moses's hands were held up by Aaron and her. We hold them up in prayer right now. We also pray for every student. We, we pray for a successful school year. We pray for good grades. We pray for attentiveness. But more importantly, for those teachers and students, we pray that they will share their faith and that they will honor and represent you well. Now, God, move me out the way that I would preach under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. We're grateful and we're thankful for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every person under the sound of my voice say amen and amen. Well, family, we are in week three of a series we are calling, say it with me, Insane Faith. And we are learning what faith is, what faith does, how faith works, and then we are looking at examples of faith. And today is a great example of different types of faith. Quick recap, family. Week one, we talked about ingrained faith. We look at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 12, and we said this, faith is believing God. That's it. Real simple, not too deep, real plain. Faith is believing God, believing what he said, believing what he did, believing what he does, believing what he will do. Week two, we talked about mundane faith. That's this faith that's, that's lazy. That's this faith where we're not actually believing the voice of doubt is louder than the voice of God. And we struggle there. And today, as we continue, last week was Matthew 17, 20. Today, we want to look at maintain faith. Say that with me. Say maintain faith. Now, listen, what is maintain faith? You may be asking that question. Maintain faith, it's a faith that is fearful, does just enough to get by, doesn't mature, and compares. Again, maintain faith is a faith that's fearful, does just enough to get by. You ever met someone like that? J j just enough. They, they, they're C people. They're happy with the C because as long as they get by, that's all that matters. Uh, doesn't mature and compares. Now, to, to, to understand what's going on here in Matthew 25, uh, Jesus gives three parables. And what he's really doing is he's answering a question from Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. His disciples asked him about the end times and what, what's going to happen when we'll know that the world is coming to an end. And so what Jesus does here in Matthew 25 is he gives three parables. The first one is a parable of ten virgins. The second parable is the parable of the talents. Then the third one is one where this guy separates sheep from goats. Let me just give you a hint. You don't want to be a goat. And so he does that here as he breaks down these parables. Now, you may be wondering, we talked about this at the beginning of the year. Now, what's a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning that teaches a kingdom principle. One more time for you. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning that teaches us a kingdom principle principle. So now we, we need to understand what's going on here. So the, the, in these parables, that's that earthly story with a heavenly meaning teaching us kingdom principles. The, the people in the story aren't necessarily real, but the consequences certainly are. The implications are, are definitely real. And so what we need to understand here is this parable first and foremost, it's all about the kingdom. When you read verse 1 of Matthew chapter 25, you learn that the kingdom is what Jesus is really explaining and what he's breaking down here. Number two is the man in the parable represents God, represents Christ, right? The, the man here is the master. And again, he's teaching us something about how the master operates and what the master expects from his servants, which brings us to the third character, if you will, and that's the three servants. The servants represent his church, or people who claim to believe in God. Now, it's important that we understand that because we need to know the difference between ingrained faith, mundane faith, maintained faith, and how we can operate in faith and live in a way that pleases God. Because the Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please him. And so in order for us to please him, we need to understand the mechanics and the intricacies of faith because faith does save us. So family, let's dive in. Verse 14. 
for it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. That brings us to our first point. Listen to me. Don't mistake your gifting with your value. Please hear me there. Don't mistake your gifting with your value. Now, the it there in verse 14 refers to the end times. That's what he's talking about. And so then he transitions to these, uh, these three servants. One gets five, one gets two, and one gets one. And to understand this, a talent is worth several hundred thousand dollars by today's measurement of money. So this wasn't a small thing that he gave each of these servants. But, but notice that the master entrusts them with his money. So the principle here, and this, this is why this is week three of insane, insane Faith, is he's saying, how do they steward what God has trusted them with? Listen, God has given you a talent. God has given you a gift or gifts. He's given you at least one. And he expects, listen to me, he expects a return on his, his investment. Now, now, too often, we think stewardship is about maintaining. But here what we see here is stewardship is about maturing and multiplying. God does not want you to just maintain what he's given you. He wants you to steward it. He wants you to mature. He wants you to multiply. And because so many people think stewardship is maintaining, they wonder why. And you may be wondering why, why, why does my relationship with God seem stale? It, it, could it be that you're operating and maintain faith? You're doing just enough to get by. You're watching just to be able to say, I watched. You'll click on a virtual group once a month just to say, I did it. You, you, you may give, maybe not, but you, you at least once a year, you say just to be able to say, I did it. See, maintain faith is just trying to get by as if God doesn't know the condition of your heart. Maintain faith does just enough to get by. And the reason I say don't mistake your gifting with your values because here, what, what God is really judging here is not just what they produce, but the attitude they have with what he's entrusted them with. It always comes back to the heart, which brings us to our next point. God is more concerned, and I want you to make this personal. God is more concerned about my faithfulness than he is my fruitfulness. God is more concerned about my faithfulness than he is my fruitfulness. Notice, uh, God is not looking at the amount, but rather what you do with what he's entrusted you with. He's not looking at, he's not, he's not going to come back to me and say, Jerome, how many, how, how many members did you have? No, he's going to say, how did you serve the members I called you to pastor? It's not about the number. It's about the heart. It's about the attitude. It's about the intent. And, and God is saying, I, I, well, what, are you, how, what are you doing with the children I've trusted you with? What are you doing with the spouse that I've trusted you with? How are you in community with the church that I told you to join? G God, is not, it's not about the numbers. He's more concerned about faithfulness than he is fruitfulness. Not that fruitfulness does matter. You know a tree by its fruit. But God is not hung up on the amount. He's looking at your heart. And so notice what he does. He, he gives each one a, a talent, a certain amount of talents, five, two, and one. But Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by grace given to me, I tell, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Here's the question. What are you doing with your measure of faith? Because see, here's the problem. Here's why I said don't confuse your giftedness with your giftedness, with your value, is because some of you here, one gets five, one gets two, one gets one, and you immediately start comparing, why did he get five? Why did he get two? Why did he only get one? And ma maintain faith compares, remember, it compares, and rather than working the amount of talents you have, you're busy looking at the amount other people have, not knowing that God is gonna judge and he wants you to give an account of what have you done with what I've given you. Don't worry about the amount they have. You steward, what, you steward well what I've given you and watch me multiply. Watch me grow you. Watch me groom you. Watch me, I may even add more to you, but first be faithful with what I've given you. And so it's so important that we don't miss this. And that's the question. What are you doing with the measure of faith that God has given you? Remember, the master gave them talents based on their abilities. Verse 15. 
Now, it, it's not God. God knows how far to stretch you. God knows how he created you and what you can handle within how he created you. And so don't 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 be upset because you only have one talent. Work that one talent. Don't be upset because you have two and not five. Work those two. And don't be upset because you have five but not ten. Work those five. God is saying, work what I've given you and watch what I do and how I reward your faithfulness towards me. Now, the next few verses are going to show us how we should respond. The question is, what, what, how am I stewarding or what am I doing with my measure of faith? Well, the next few verses are going to give us two ways or two examples, the two faithful servants and the one unfaithful servant. Verse 15, the A clause. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, earned five more. In the same way, the man who had earned two more, but the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, uh, uh, presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Very important verse. The man who had two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Now, now listen to this. Two servants hear, Well done. But notice they don't hear, Well done, based on the amount that they multiplied the talents. He doesn't say, Well done, you gave me five more. Well done, you've get presented to me. He said, well done, you've been faithful, insane faith. Well done, you've been faithful. Listen to me. God is just asking. God is, is saying, I want you to be faithful, faithful to your marriage, faithful to your church, faithful to your children, faithful to the call that I have placed on your life. God is looking for us to be faithful. Now, here's a question we got to ask. What does faithfulness look like? Uh, many of us can answer this in our question relationally, right? Faithfulness looks like someone who doesn't lie to me, who supports me, who, who encourages me, who loves me, who doesn't put me down, who isn't abusive. It's interesting we can answer that question the way we want to receive faithfulness. But what about when God is on the receiving end? How would God answer that question? Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but th these few verses gives us some examples of the type of faithfulness God wants you and I to give him back. Number one, notice the one who produced five, who was given five and, and, and basically doubled what he had. It was immediate. Listen, one with five talents didn't, didn't take long. Like when, when God trusted him, when the master trusted him, he went quickly. Listen, too many of you, under the sound of my voice, you overthink and you underwork. Hear me? You overthink and you underwork. God has told you to do something. God has given you vision. God has given you confirmation. Others say, I see this in you, but you overthink and you underwork and you have not moved. Notice, faithfulness is about being immediate. Now, I'm not saying that we don't pray and we don't plan, but listen, even praying and planning is active. It's doing something with the seed God has put in you. Here's my question to you. What are you sitting on? What vision, what book, what business, what ministry are you sitting on? Or how about this? Who are you procrastinating on calling? God is telling you to do something. Notice this servant was immediate, but you've been procrastinating. Why aren't you serving? God, God calls his people to serve. That He, he doesn't say that people got to meet your prerequisites for you to serve his church. You should be immediate as a sign of your devotion to him. The second thing, uh, uh, faithfulness is joyous. Notice in verse 20, uh, the, the servant with five talents uh, and the one with two, they were happy to say, Master, look what I did with what you've trusted me with. Just like a child to their parent, you know, Jordan, my son recently, uh, he, he's been seeing me work really hard on the book project. And he came and he, he showed me 
uh, a book he created. He, he took some cardboard and, and paper, and he said, now he, he's a child, he said, yeah, daddy, I wrote a children's book. <laughs> and so he wrote a book for children younger than him about God, and watch this, about the deity of Christ. So he writes this book, and then he flipped it, and on the back he got a summary of the book and his little picture in the corner of the book. And he was so happy to show me, Daddy, look what I created. That's the attitude, listen, uh, of these servants. They're probably grown people. And they're saying, Daddy, look what I did. My daughter, she's into art. She makes magnificent artwork, uh, art pieces. And when she shows it to me, there's an excitement to say, say, Daddy, look what I've done. You should be, remember, we said this in week one, ingrained or insane faith wants to please God. Faithfulness is when you want to make God happy. You want to make him smile. Number three, faithfulness is efficient. The one with two talents, he, he gained two more. So evidently, they, they were efficient. They prayed. They thought about this. They put this to work, and they were efficient with what they were entrusted with. Number four, faithfulness is active. Listen, the, the two servants, the two faithful servants, chose to honor their master by putting the talent to work. Again, maybe it involved prayer, it involved some planning, but a third P is necessary to produce. They were active with it. They, they didn't just talk about what they were going to do. They did it. Number five, they were consistent. Listen, don't miss this. The text says this in verse 19. The text says the master's return after a long time. Now remember, this parable is about the kingdom. So what this is about is the theological idea of the advent of Christ. The first advent is when he's born into the earth, right? He's born through the womb of Mary. He ascends. Now we await his second advent. It's, going to, it's a long time between the ascension of Jesus and his return. Remember, this is all about the end times, the end of the world, and the, the master, God, coming back, inspecting what his servants has done. But notice this, it was a long time. So it was a long time of them investing and making money, investing and getting a return, investing and making a return. How many of you have quit because you think God is taking too long? Faithfulness is consistent. Number six, prepared. Don't, don't forget this. The parable of the talents is after, is preceded by the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, there, were, there were five virgins that were prepared for the bridegroom's arrival, but then there were five who were not. And so faithfulness looks like being prepared or in position for the blessing, being in position for the pouring of God. This is, the, this is the point he's saying, if you steward what I've given you well, when I want to bless you or if I want to test you, whatever it is, you'll be prepared because you faithfully stewarded what I've given you. Some of you are missing out simply because you haven't worked the gift or gifts that God has given you. Now, family, why is this so essential? This is so important because remember, this is all about Christ's return. Are you ready? No, 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 for real, for the Bible says this, to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith or not. This isn't a game. Are you ready? Though you don't know when it's gonna happen, you can be prepared. Our next point, here's the, here's the point, right? This is why this is so essential. Listen, God does not reward intention he rewards action. It's not, I, I, I intended to invest. No, you should have invested. I intended, God, God is not looking at you to, I intended on praying. I intended on calling. I intended on sharing my faith. No, God, God doesn't reward intention. He rewards action. And we see this right here in the text. What did the faithful servants receive? Four things. Number one is con commendation. They were commended by God. He said two words we all want to hear. Well done. They receive inspiration. He calls them faithful. He speaks life into them, the master does. He says not only well done, but he calls them faithful, good and faithful servant. Number three, I know we all want this, relaxation. He says enter the joy of your master. Some version says enter your master's rest. Relaxation. So they got commendation, inspiration, relaxation, and then I love this number four, promotion. God says, you've been faithful over this little bit. In faith, now I can trust you with more. Listen, stop asking for more if you're not working what you have. 
Stop praying for more if you're not working what you have. God says, be faithful with that. Then I see that you're, I can trust you with more. Listen, don't expect a promotion from God if you're living with maintained faith. If you, if you show up just enough to be able to let someone see your faith, if you watch just enough to be able to say you did it, God says, look, what, what type of relationship? See, see, would you want someone to treat you that way? So often we treat God the way we would never want someone to treat us. So we, we see the two faithful servants, they, they wanted to make their master happy. They were immediate, aware, I've, I've said this for years, they were expedient in their obedience. They didn't overthink and underwork, they put it to work. Let me encourage you, work your gift. Work your gift and God will bless it. Verse 24, the man, had, the man who had received one talent, uh, let, let's see what this guy says, check this out, also approached and said, Master, I know you. You are a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went off and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant. That seemed kind of hard, right? But it's true. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then why? Then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have more than enough. But the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him and throw this good for nothing servant to the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Now, what does unfaithfulness look like? We, we talked about what faithfulness looks like, but we also need to talk about what unfaithfulness looks like because we're talking about maintained faith. We're talking about insane faith, the type of faith God wants us to have. And so we need to look at this. What does maintained faith look like? Well, number one, it's non-committal. Be careful of people who don't commit. They don't commit to churches. They, they, they don't commit their time. They don't commit their money. Be careful of people who are non-committal. People who are non-committal, they're unfaithful in some other areas of their life. And we see this here. He wasn't really committed to the master. This is why his first statement to the master was, I know that you are a harsh man. Verse 24. Now, now check this out. I, I've, I've trusted you with thousands by, by American standard of measurement, over hundreds of thousands of dollars. And your response to me is, I know you a harsh man. Never forget this. Pressure reveals how people really feel about you. <laughs> That's free. Pressure reveals how people really fear about you. And here's a leadership point. Check this out. Don't, don't be afraid to allow non-committed people to walk. Here's why. Because if they're not really committed, you're not losing anything when they leave anyway. I'm not saying that to be mean. This is a principle in Scripture. Jesus tells them to shake the dust off and move on. That throughout Scripture, he says, listen, when people don't want it, you can't make them do it. But, but we need to look out for, yeah, and I want some of you, some of you understand my voice. You, you know, if you're really honest, you just don't commit. And you find every reason to justify your lack of commitment. And you're operating like this unfaithful servant. Number two, uh, unfaithfulness devalues. Notice, not, notice how not only does he criticize the master, but his rationale is based on his value of the master. This, this is why he says, look, you reaped where you haven't sown. So he's saying, listen, you, you got some, he's basically saying you, you've received things you don't deserve. And so you're not, in high, you're not in a high regard of my life. So because you're not in high regard for my life, you don't deserve my best. You get my leftovers. Oh, how many of us treat God that way? You, you, you may never say it with your mouth, but if we were to really examine how you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you see God's church, if you serve God's church, would it, would it show us that you really devalue God and his bride? Number three, maintain faith. Unfaithfulness looks like fear. He says, I was afraid and I hid. See, too many of us of, are afraid of uh, how we're going to look. 
Remember, we said this week one, listen, Paul says, I'm willing to be a fool for Christ. You can't be concerned about your reputation. It has to be about his glory. And this is why we're calling this insane faith, because insane is how you're going to look to some people when you operate in faith. Insane is how you feel doing some things when God tells you to call that person you don't want to call, to write that thing you don't want to write. But God says, if you do it, watch what I do. You're just faithful to me. Number four, unfaithfulness hides. What did he do with the talent? He hid it. And that's some of you right now. You play an instrument or you can sing or you have good organizational skills or, or you, 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 you're great at connecting with people, but, but something is inside of you. And it's, listen, it's not from God because God would never tell you to abandon or not serve his church. But, but you said, you know, I, I'm going to hide it because they're going to ask me to do something. And God says, like, why would you treat me that way? Remember, Jesus says this to Paul. He says, when you persecute the church, you're persecuting me. Listen, when you neglect the church, you're neglecting the bride. I'm sorry, you're neglecting the groom, Jesus, the groom of the church. When you neglect, when you abuse, when you abandon the church of God, you abandon the God of the church. And it's so important that we, we get this. I know we're in a pandemic. I know uh, there are many reasons for us to uh, excuse us saying we're drained. I just, I'm just tired. But, but notice, see, it was a long time before the master came back, but they were faithful and they were consistent. Number five, maintain faith is lazy. I don't have to, I won't need too much exegesis for this. The master says, you wicked and lazy servant. He calls him lazy. But check this out. Maintain faith mismanages. Listen, how you treat the gifts of God reflects how you see God. How do you treat, again, I keep saying this because I feel the Holy Spirit is really challenging some of us in this area. How do you see his church? How do you see your money? How do you spend your time? And if you see it as only yours, that's the problem. Remember, it was the master's gift. They were to the steward it. That breath you're breathing, that's the master's you and I are the steward. That bank account, that's his. You and I are the steward. That gift you have, it's his. Give it back to him. Now, what did the unfaithful servant receive? Now, we saw the, the faithful servants receive commendation, inspiration, relaxation, and promotion. But what did this unfaithful servant receive? He received confrontation. He called him evil to his face. He called him lazy to his face. Now listen, I, I'll say this, I'd I, I rather hear that now than before Christ returns. Lord, 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 show me, show me my wickedness. Show me the areas where I'm lazy. Show me and confront me. He was demoted. Remember, uh, uh, he, he went from a servant to now being an outcast by ver verse 30. And then condemnation. Now you say, wrong. but the pastor, the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we got to ask, if someone treats the master this way and criticizes the master to his face and devalues the master and doesn't use what the master has given them, are they really in the faith? He was cast to the outer darkness. This is, this is important, family. Please, please don't miss this. This is why the master was so hard, because maintain faith isn't authentic. He wasn't just unfaithful. He was faithless. He was faithless and didn't steward the things of God well. So what are these three parables? Now we focus on just the middle one, the, the meat of the sandwich of the 10 virgins and then the parable of the talents and then right under that is the parable of sheep and goats. The, the 10 virgin t uh, parable teaches us this, that the gospel prepares us. The five that were not prepared were not prepared. And when the bridegroom came, they missed out. The door was closed and they could not get back in. The gospel, salvation by grace and through faith, prepares us for when Jesus returns. Number two, the gospel provides. The gospel provides the means of salvation so that we can hear those famous words, well done. But listen, the gospel also provides us and leads us to provide for the church. Remember, he wanted them to multiply what he has given them. God wants us to grow. God wants us, to, his church to grow. God wants his church, he wants more members added to his family. He wants us to steward the gospel well. He wants us to steward the resources that he's entrusted us with well. But then... 
So the gospel prepares, the gospel provides. But then the sheep and goats, the gospel must be proclaimed. When you see about the sheep and goats, it's about the least of these. People that are poor, the, the prisoner, they need to hear the gospel. Everyone needs to hear it, but they must hear a message that is proclaimed. Now listen, Jesus has gone away, but he will return. How are you stewarding? your finances, because this talents represents money. How are you stewarding your gifting, what God has placed inside of you? A very important question, family. How are you stewarding the gospel? Family, you, you guys know I am a avid sports fan. Um, I, I have been excited to see the NBA come back, and these NBA bubble games, all of them have been phenomenal. It's been amazing that, you know, not having a crowd, just seeing how hard these guys play. But recently, a player received a, a lot of press, not for what he did on the court, but for what he did off the court. This guy's name is Wenyan Gabriel. He's a Sudanese man, young guy, only in his 20s, and he plays for the Portland Trailblazers. He just recently joined the team. And um, he, he, he joined the team, and he, he's not a, a superstar, so he, he didn't get one of those huge contracts. So he, he lives in an apartment, um, a nice apartment, but he catches an Uber, and uh, he called an Uber, and it was an older gentleman who uh, was driving him on this Uber. And on this particular trip, once he got all the way to his house, uh, he realized that he had forgotten his wallet. He forgot his wallet. And hours had gone by. For some reason, he wasn't able to connect and get back to, to connect through the Uber app with the, the older gentleman by the name of John Bernard. And he, he's just wondering, I think a, a, a lot of time had went by and he was wondering, you know, is he gonna get his wallet back? In fact, it went on into the next day because he talked about how he couldn't sleep. Then all of a sudden he hears a, a knock at the door. And, and here it is, he opens the door and he, here's this older gentleman with, who talks about he has osteoporosis from years of running track, an older gentleman, and he could barely breathe because he has a long stairway and he's holding a wallet. And Winyan tr tries to give him, Winyan tries to give him $100, but the, the gentleman just wouldn't take it. He just wouldn't take it. And, and, and this happened um, right, right before the, the pandemic really began to spread really hard. And so we begin to learn how the, the older demographic is, is high risk for catching the virus and it being fatal for them. And so uh, the older gentleman leaves, and then when, when COVID hits, because they, they had some time in his house because the older gentleman was tired, they talked and talked, and Gabriel was really affected. Winnie and Gabriel was really affected by this older gentleman. The fact that he would walk up all those steps, the fact that he could barely breathe, but he would do that. And so when COVID hit, Winnie decided to do something extra for the, for the older gentleman. He put $2,500 in his account so that he would not have to drive an Uber during the pandemic because this older man was at such a high risk. Listen, he did this, he did not tweet it, did not Instagram, did not tell anyone, but the older gentleman reached out to the Portland Trailblazers and said, I, I want you guys to know about what Winnie and Gabriel did for me. Then he asked, they asked the, the older guy, John Bernard even further, and he said, listen, the world needs to know what this young man did for me. Family, when I think about the gospel and I think about who I was, how I used to live, what I used to do, and how God is still working in and through me. When you think about where you were, who you were, who you were doing, what you were doing with, and God still works in your life. If you're going to steward the gospel well, the world needs to know what Jesus has done for you. If a gentleman can respond that way to $2,500, how much more should we respond to salvation by grace and through faith? And let me tell you this, you're not stewarding the gospel if you're not sharing it. You're not stewarding it if you're not sharing it. People need to hear. This is why I've been asking you every week, who are the names? So we're going to pray again. I want you to type your names or, it, or just the, the initials in the comments. We're going to pray because the world needs to know what Jesus has done. We don't need to operate and maintain faith. We don't need to just get by. We get to thrive because Jesus has made a way for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that, that, that you speak to us. That in the same way, the older gentleman was appreciative for what a young man 
did for him. How much more? So we'll be appreciative of who you are and what you have done for us on the cross. God, that's the gospel. You died on the cross for our sins. We did not deserve it. You're just that good. And I pray right now, God, I pray that as names are being typed or initials are being typed, God, that we would see our friends, our family members, our co-workers, those, those people we're believing you for, that they will place faith in you. God, God, we, we, we'll take our boldness a step further. God, use us. Use us boldly to share our faith. Use us boldly to answer their questions. Use us to be there and serve them so that they will trust you, Jesus. It's not about us. It's about you, God. Because you're going to come back and you're going to inspect what you expect. God, and we want to be ready and we want others to be ready. The gospel makes us ready. So we thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Family, I pray that uh, you said that prayer. I pray that you are joining me. I'm going to continue to reach out throughout the week. We're going to join our faith together and we're going to continue to pray for God to move in the lives of people. Well, for this Friends and Family Day family, we are taking Holy Communion. So I pray that you have the elements. I give you one more moment. Get your bread, get your juice ready as we honor God by taking Holy Communion together as a family. Family, I can't tell you how much I've missed doing this every Sunday. I've missed just seeing the body of Christ in the building. But family, hang on in there. God is still good. He's still in control. and He's with us. If you have the elements, family, um, we know this is in all four Gospels, just this reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So I'm asking for you to hold up your bread, representing the body of Christ. Break it, and let's eat in remembrance of him. Hold up the cup, representing the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us drink together as a family in remembrance of him. Thank you. Before I pray, again, if you're a guest, we're going to be in the lobby. The elders would love to meet and pray with you again. Father, thank you uh, for allowing us to take the Holy Communion to remember your sacrifice. We're grateful for who you are and what you've done. In Christ's name, amen. I love you guys. See you next week. Peace.